I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the most affordable Audi Q5 that you can buy here in Australia. In today's video, we're gonna be seeing just how much Audi Q5 you get for less than $70,000 before on-road costs, because that's what this base model Q540 TDI Quattro costs you. So you are still getting a Quattro system. This vehicle is all wheel drive across the range and under the bonnet, there's a 150 kilowatt, two liter turbo diesel four cylinder engine. So, I mean, it's hardly a stripper specification and given that it's at least sort of 10 grand more than a top end Volkswagen Tiguan that sits on a slightly different platform, you would be expecting that even an entry level Audi Q5 is gonna give you a luxury car experience. The good news is that we'll discover in today's video, you do get that. This is a very thoroughly thought out vehicle and one that actually drives really sweetly, particularly because of those nice small wheels and chunky tires that give it a great ride quality out here in Australia. But we're gonna be doing our usual thing. We'll jump inside the Q5, we'll chat about price, standard features and comfort. We'll have a look at the back seats and the boot, talk about the running costs, and then I'll take this Q540 TDI diesel out for a drive to let you know if this is the particular engine you should be going for. But before we get started, make sure to hit subscribe down below that video. The quality in here is really, really good. Uh, and even things down to like the seats. After driving three or four hours, you realize Audi's given the Q5 a set of properly ergonomic seats. So, you know, you don't get the same level of fatigue. These are good seats in the Q5, even though they don't look like anything special. Similarly, you know, we've just got plain silver trim here. Yeah, it'd be nicer if it was brushed aluminium for sure. But the fixtures and the fittings of the Q5 all feel hewn from granite, basically. That's the impression that you get in this car. A couple of exceptions. The grab handles on the doors are just plastic, which is weird. In the Audi A4 sedan and wagon, which the Q5 is kind of paired with in the range, those are like soft, squidgy, color-coded, nice pieces. Weird oversight. Anyway, what else have we got here in the Q5? We've got this new screen for 2021. It's a good size, 10 inches, wireless CarPlay is included. That's very convenient. And the actual interface itself is easy to use, but the Q5 lost its rotary dial in the process, which is a bit of a shame. However, all Q5s come with the full 12 inch virtual cockpit, satellite mapping through Google Maps and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Got this big ish steering wheel here, leather lined paddle shifters, lovely design on this delicate little airbag hub though. And we've got nice clicky controls for things like the climate, even down to the buttons on the steering wheel, there's really nice tactile feedback in the Audi interior. Well, it's got standard wireless charging, decent cup holders, cubby spaces everywhere from like where they ripped out the old rotary controller and big door bins. So I guess the summary of the interior of the Audi is it isn't as fancy to look at, but as you start to spend more time with this car, you realize the ergonomics are bang on and the technology works really well. And even things like the fact this car only has the base Audi stereo, I think it's only a hundred watts. It sounds great. It's actually got really good drivers in it. It's really clear. So I guess they've really put a bit of thought into the Q5 and you can option it up to be significantly more impressive inside if you want to, but even in base form, it's pretty impressive. Here in the back of the Q5, you get pretty much what you would expect from a mid-size luxury crossover. It's spacious enough, myself at six foot, headroom is really good, this is tall, there is the new Sportback version of the Q5 which is a bit more swoopy, this one is more practical. Leg room behind my own driving position is good, toe room is good. Here in the middle seat there's a massive hump in the floor so you wouldn't want to use that too often, but with four people on board this is comfortable, definitely. Air vents are standard, separate temperature zone standard. We've got two more USB-A ports here. 12 volt socket, mapping, or netting I should say, uh, for maps on the back of both of the seats. We've got a flip down armrest here with cup holders, and we've got bottle holders in the doors, and those sort of semi-soft materials continue here in the back of the Q5. If you need more space or a third row, they can certainly sell you the Q7. 
The Q5 is certainly one of the more understated designs in the midsize SUV class, but it really works for me, even in this color combination, which typically would be, I don't know, a depreciation special, floret silver over black leather inside, and these painted gray bumpers. That's now standard, it used to be plastic cladding. Uh, you know, I think it presents quite smartly. Now you can do more interesting color combinations than this if you want to, but one thing that's really nice about the base model Q5 is that it gets these anodized aluminum highlights outside rather than a black pack. Black packs are weird. They usually cost you more, but you get less. You get unpainted black plastic. But anyway, I quite like this new aluminum bar that they've put across the back and the detailing in the tail lights is really smart. All in all, pretty hard to complain about the looks of the Q5, I reckon. Also hard to complain about the fact that for once we've got a power tailgate that's actually quite fast and it opens up to reveal 520 litres of space, more than enough for the three chasing cars suitcases and we've got a host of other clever features. Really thick high quality cargo blind, latches to release the 40-20-40 folding rear seats, cubby spaces off to the left and the right, a wine bottle holder or strap there in the boot and a space saver spare underneath the boot floor. And finally, this nice little chrome finisher here so you don't scratch uh, that floor at silver metallic paint. Then we've got controls to close the boot or close it and lock the car. Last step for us before we take a drive is to chat running costs. Now, some of them are actually attractively low and that starts with fuel consumption. This vehicle is really frugal, even compared to some of the most efficient vehicles in the class. Now, Volkswagen do know how to do a very frugal diesel engine. I mean, you could put an asterisk there on old diesel gate stuff if you want to, but this engine isn't part of that pack at all. What it is though, is reliably efficient in the real world. On the highway, this vehicle will give you about five and a half liters per 100 kilometers with a light load, a little bit more with a full load on board. And even around town where a vehicle like this uses the most fuel, we were able to extract seven liters per 100 Ks out of it, which I think is pretty impressive. Servicing, generally quite expensive on Audis. You can save a bit of money by purchasing an upfront service plan. The five year 75,000 kilometer plan will set you back $3,140, which again is still at the higher end for a vehicle of this size and shape. And lastly, insurance. In the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer spent $1,364 to comprehensively insure a new Audi Q5. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things like your driving history, where you live, and how you garage the car. So what is the cheapest Audi Q5 like to drive? And is it worth spending more on one of the higher spec models or one of the more powerful versions of the Audi Q5? Well, to be honest, the short answer to that is for most people, no. The Q5 40 TDI is a really good all-rounder that's gonna suit most buyers out here in Australia or potentially in the market where you're watching this video from because it is powerful enough. It's got lots of torque right off the line. The fuel consumption is pretty low and the handling is good for a luxury midsize SUV. But let me first start by talking about the engine and where the Q5 fits into uh, the lineup as the 40 TDI. Now, Audi's engine badging strategy is at times confusing but effectively the number just corresponds to a kilowatt or horsepower band uh, and 40 TDI corresponds to 150 kilowatts in this case in diesel and the engine's a two litre turbocharged unit 150 kilowatts and 400 newton meters of torque and this is a Volkswagen group four-cylinder diesel engine that's done service for many years now it has been updated throughout the years and the Q540 TDI has got a mild hybrid system bolted onto it that basically means that the engine shuts down very smoothly pretty much whenever the Q5 runs down through 22 kilometers per hour. So when you're approaching a red light as opposed to when you stop, the engine doesn't just conk out at zero, instead it just sort of glides out underneath 22 and it's a really nice refined start-stop system that works well. But as you can probably hear, or not hear, just driving around the burbs as I am now, this is a really quiet and well insulated four cylinder diesel. You know, a Q5 diesel four pot even 10 years ago sounded pretty agricultural, uh, you know, like rattling a chain, but 
it doesn't any longer. Unless you're really revving hard, you can't even tell it's diesel most of the time, and I think that's a pretty good feat. And of course, the fuel consumption that we've already run through is really manageable. These sorts of flexible, torquey diesels are good at pulling around the best part of two tons. I think the Q540 TDI is about 1880 kilos, so with passengers and cargo, it's a two ton bus. The other engines are also pretty good. There's a petrol Q5, uh, which a similar number of buyers tend to choose. That's the 45 TFSI, a 180 kilowatt, two litre turbo petrol, also mild hybrid, uh, nice and flexible, sounds a little better than the diesel, of course, but it doesn't have as much torque, uh, 350 newton meters of it, uh, and it does need a little bit more of a rev than the diesel, uh, but it's still a nice engine, but the fuel consumption is gonna be sort of 20, 30% higher in the real world, and it costs more to buy in the first place too. Then there's the 50 TDI, which is a 210 kilowatt V6, three liter turbo diesel, and that's when you start to get into pretty lush territory, because uh, that is a seriously strong engine. Six cylinder diesels sound a lot better than four cylinder diesels, so even though this one isn't bad, uh, the V6 diesel has that really nice, bassy sort of rush to it. Uh, they all pair to a Quattro all drive system, but the V6 models, so the 50 TDI and also the sporty SQ5 TDI, they have a rear biased all drive system and they also have an eight speed torque converter automatic gearbox. The four cylinder cars can run in front drive automatically on the highway if there's no need for all drive, but any use of the throttle pedal sees the rear wheels brought in to the equation under power, but they have a seven speed dual clutch auto. But honestly, this S-Tronic gearbox, same as a Volkswagen DSG, it's actually really good. Um, I forgot it was a DCT for the first few days of driving this car, because uh, it's, it's pretty hard to flummox these days. As for ride and handling, well, on these 19 inch wheels and chunky tires, it's, it's really good actually. It soaks up urban imperfections really well and quite a lot better than a Q5 on 20 inch wheels. You can get air suspension as an option on most of the Q5 lineup, uh, not this absolute base model, but on most of the lineup. And you generally need air suspension on the Q5 to make it ride well, but here, at the bottom of the range on smaller wheels, chunkier rubber, it doesn't need that, it rides great. So this is a really good option um, for those of us that spend our days kind of traversing crap Sydney roads. But then on a country road, as we've got a bit of B-roll overlay here, it actually can hold its own really nicely, it turns in well. The steering doesn't have a huge amount of feel. It's fairly quick though, mid-weighted but it gets that front hooked in really nicely, particularly with a fairly light four cylinder engine hanging over it. And the rear follows quite daintily as well. You can actually play with the chassis balance a bit in this car. There's something for a keen driver as well as a, a commuter or a mum or dad doing the school run, which is kind of what you want at this price, isn't it? As for safety, mm, so there's a 1800 buck assistance package which really should be standard on this car because that's the only way you can unlock high speed AEB and adaptive cruise control and you also get a 360 degree camera and I'm neither here nor there on the adaptive cruise but a 70 grand SUV should have high speed AEB and the 360 degree camera certainly makes it easier to park so I really think Audi should consider just making that package a standard fitment item. If it has to bump up the base price, then so be it, I guess. But you don't really need any other options. It's, it's well equipped and comfortable as it is. So those are my detailed opinions on the Audi Q5 40 TDI, the least expensive Q5 you can buy. Now, this vehicle is actually quite a breath of fresh air because it's becoming um, frustratingly rare that a base model luxury SUV is good enough. Most of this car's rivals really require you to buy at least a level two variant with a whole bunch of options in order to make it feel livable. The BMW X3 and the Mercedes GLC, for example, you really don't want the base version of those cars. You know, you want adaptive dampers, all of that sort of thing. You can walk into an Audi dealership and have them give you a base Q5 with the assistance package so you get high speed autonomous emergency braking. 
uh, and it's perfectly sufficient. It's comfortable, it's sporty, it's high quality. So it really leaves me little grounds to complain about this car. It is good at achieving the brief of a mid-size luxury SUV. Just do yourself a favor and also test drive the A4 station wagon, which is about the same price as this car, but is even better to drive because of its lower center of gravity. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Tell me yours down below in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already done so. Join us. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.